Okay, so um, I would like to really thank the organizers for this uh, absolutely fantastic uh, conference. And so this is joint work with Ishul, who is sitting uh, right here, Chen Houten and Mike Weisbach. Uh, so what the paper is about, well, if you read the title, Selecting Directors Using Machine Learning, this gives you uh, a, well, a pretty good idea, um, right? So it's an application of the predictive power of machine learning tools. Um, and now if I show you this picture, I'll try to give you an even better idea. So ideally what you would see on this picture is a bunch of people here, and you would see a bunch of people there, and then an empty seat right here, which is an open board seat to be filled. Right? And the question is, how do firms decide who gets a seat at the table? Right? And what we're especially interested in is kind of the decision-making process that goes into selecting corporate directors. Um, and so we've known since Adam Smith and Berlin Mintz that we can expect this process to be filled or to be plagued with uh, agency issues. And one big factor why that's the case is, is that the CEO typically is in charge, right? Typically the CEO is in charge uh, of deciding who is going to be uh, the next director to sit at that table. Um, and to, you know, by way of motivating why this is important, um, you know, consider collectively all directors. Well, they play non-trivial roles in the trajectory of the economy because they are the ones who make the key decisions at every key inflection point during the firm's life. Right? And so what we do in this paper is we consider the nomination of corporate directors as a white hat problem, right? So to use Sandel's classification. So uh, it's a prediction problem. And so what we do is we task the algorithm with trying to predict the performance of potential directors. Um, and we think this is an interesting approach because it can speak to the quality, the current quality of those decisions. And maybe more interestingly, it can help as a, you know, if we use the algorithmic input, right? If you, we use those predictions, they can help as a diagnostic tool to try to better understand and shed some light on the nomination process. And so we really view our work as a first pass exercise using publicly available data. We do have lots of data, lots of interesting data, but it has, it does have some limitations, right? And so we've had the talk at lunch, you know, and, and the lady, you know, Raquel, she said, you know, industry is like a, a data paradise, so we don't swim in that paradise currently. Um, and so more data um, could help us, you know, um, draw, you know, get more interesting results, obviously. So first pass exercise. Um, one reason why we're particularly excited about bringing in those new machine learning tools in the governance space um, is that, as you know, those tools are really good at what we're typically really bad. So they're complementary to you know, human strength. So they're really good at picking up signal, discarding nodes, all of that stuff. And so uh, we think that they can really help us um, you know, with the agency conflicts that are present in the board nomination process. Okay, so I said that we give the algorithm the task um, of predicting future director performance. So maybe surprisingly, this is a very nebulous concept. And so there is absolutely no consensus in the literature as to what that should be, maybe surprisingly. Um, but in our case, it's crucial, right? And so there actually has been some discussion yesterday about the fact that if the algorithm is trying to predict an outcome, well, you better make sure that that outcome is something you really care about, right? So for us in this prediction context, it's crucial. Our measure of director performance is actually crucial to the exercise. And so in the paper, we detail why we think the measure that we use is a really good measure. Um, so the bottom line is that we use shareholder votes. So how happy shareholders are going to be about a specific director is going to be the metric that we're going to use to evaluate them, right? And so again, we go at length in the paper as to why we think this is, this is an interesting metric. I'm gonna spare you the detail. I'm just going to go into one of the reasons why we think it's a good metric for director performance. And the reason is that it creates a setup that helps mitigate the concern of the algorithms being a biased propagator. And so there's a growing voice in the AI community and in the public sphere as well that you know, those machine learning algorithms are just slave to the data and that they're just going to replicate and worsen all of our worst um, inclinations as human beings, right? all of our biases. And those concerns are obviously 
very, very legitimate, even though I do think that the baselines with which those algorithms should be um, evaluated should not necessarily be a zero bias, but more the current state of biases at play, given that humans are currently making those decisions, right? But anyway, so why does it create, why using shareholder votes is a good way to kind of help mitigate that bias is that essentially we have two different entities, right? So we have the board here alongside with the CEO who are the decision makers. They make the decision, they decide on the identity of the new guy. Right? And so in effect, what they do is they're going to generate all of our right-hand side variables, all of our features. Is it male, you know, female, busy, number of directorships, background, expertise, nationality, all of that stuff. All of the right-hand side variables decided by the decision maker here. Right? And then we have shareholders who come in and vote and effectively generate our labels, the left-hand side variables. Right? And so they get to decide. And so those are two separate entities. And to the extent that you believe that those two entities have separate biases, different, uh, you know, separate sets of biases and, um, and incentives, then this helps to really mitigate this concern that the algorithm is just going to propagate all of the biases of the decision maker. Okay, I'm gonna skip that. And so all of the results that I'm going to show you are relative to the new director appointments in our test set. And so on the uh, x-axis here, you've got this as of predicted performance. And on the y-axis, you have the actual performance of directors. And all of those colorful lines are going to be the performance of the different machine learning algorithms. And so what you see is that those directors predicted to do poorly, well, indeed, they do much worse than those predicted to do well. And it's just like a simple test for us to say, this is exactly what we would want to see. And uh, we can contrast that to what the, an OLS model would do, for example, when the OLS model maybe not surprisingly out of sample really struggles uh, along that dimension. So we're interested in these guys here in the bottom this up because those are directors who are hired. The algorithm predicted there would be bad directors and they indeed turn out to be bad directors and shareholders are unhappy with them. And so who are they and why were they hired is kind of what we're after here in the paper. But before we can do that, we need to turn to two big and related issues, right? And so um, those two issues have been highly, brilliantly highlighted by Sandal and co-authors in their bail paper, right? And we really, they set up a really helpful framework for us to think carefully about these issues. So the selective labels problem and the reliance um, um, by the decision maker on, on unobservables, right? And so uh, I'm not going, Sandal talked about this this morning, so I'm not going to go into detail as to what that is. It's essentially the counterfactual problem that we don't have the counterfactual. So our way around the issue is for each new board position, we're going to create a pool of potential candidates, right? And so those are going to be directors who around the same time accepted a directorship at a, small nearby at a smaller nearby company. And so in effect, those directors were um, available. They were willing to travel you know, there for board meetings and they would have been likely to accept the directorship. And so for those potential candidates, we don't have their label, right? That's the selective labels. We don't have their label, but what we do have is what we call their quasi-label, right? And what it is, it's their performance on the board that they effectively join. And this is going to be key, key in the paper. So here's a sketch of the procedure that we use. And so uh, for each bo new board position in our test set, we're going to rank all of the higher directors according to their predicted performance as predicted by the algorithm. We're gonna zoom in on the bottom decile. So those are directors who are predicted would perform poorly. And then we ask, okay, so who else was available and how did they perform? And then the goal is going to be to look at where does Y here, the actual performance of directors predicted to do poorly, where does Y sit in that distribution of quasi-labels. So intuitively, if Y ranks high up here, what this tells us is that the algorithm predicted the directors would do poorly, but when we compare the actual performance to um, available candidates, it actually turns out to do pretty well. So whatever Zs, whatever unobservables was used by the decision maker, by the board, to come up with the decision was actually helpful, 
right? And so, and, you know, it's all good, right? And so, on the other hand, if Y sits slow in that distribution of quasi-label, what does that mean? It means that the algorithm was able to identify directors who are predicted to do poorly, and indeed, when compared to potential alternatives, they do turn out to do pretty badly. And so what this suggests is that whatever observables they used was either noise or bias or you know, misaligned incentives. And we don't take a stand, we're agnostic as of now, it's just the, the subject of a follow-on paper to dig digger into, is it bias, is it mis misaligned incentives, and so on. So next we go, so here's the finding. So what do we find? We find that it's, you know, the median rank in the distribution of quasi-label is at the 27th percentile. So pretty low. And when we, so directors in the first decile of predicted performance sits at the 27th percentile, whereas directors predicted to do well, they tend to rank pretty high. And so this is using the XGBoost algorithm. And if we compare, again, like we always contrast to what an OLS model would give us, and the OLS model just really struggles again. I'm almost done. <laughs> and so next we turn to our um, little diagnostic tool. And what we find is that those, remember I told you we wanted to zoom in on those directors who are predictably bad, and who are they? Well, maybe not surprisingly, those tend to be the usual suspects in terms of they tend to be exactly your stereotypical uh, director, right? So they tend to be men with large networks, um, with lots of currents and prior directorships. And one of the underrated feature is the number of qualifications. So to wrap up, what we do in this paper is we take the predictions from those machine learning algorithms. So the algorithmic input is gonna help us understand the decision-making process that goes into nominating uh, corporate directors. And to a large extent, our results are completely not surprising. We've known this for over 200 years. Um, and so, but we don't necessarily take this as meaning that we're back to square one, because we think that this can provide um, the necessary tools for change. And so if we're able to strike the right balance in the division of labor between humans and machine, and so combine the strength of both, then potentially we can um, implement some actionable decision aid that can help improve corporate governance, which is what we care about. Thank you. I look forward to your comments. Thank you very much. Okay.